All right, everybody, good to see you today. Hope we're doing well. Uh, My name is Al. I'm the lead pastor at Compassion. And if this is your first time here, I want you to know that I do not always wear a suit when I preach. Um, So uh, the people who who are here on a regular basis know uh, that I normally dress kind of casually. And uh, I want to explain the reason that I do that, because sometimes I think it's, I'm not trying to justify it at all, because I I, I truly believe in why I do this. When I dress for church, I really try to dress for the people that we're trying to attract. And what I mean by that is this. You know, years ago, it was very standard for people to dress up and wear their Sunday best, right? We know that. And if you still like to dress up, that's awesome. There's, there's no problem with that at all. But what we discovered is that over the years, that there were people who really saw the dress code of the church as a barrier to coming. They felt as if, you know, I don't really have church clothes I don't have church clothes, and so I can't come to church. And so my philosophy is is that we want to try to encourage people to come as they are. Uh, So I would much rather have somebody coming to church in uh, jeans and a t-shirt than sitting at home because they feel like, you know, I can't come because I don't have, I don't meet the dress code. The reason I'm wearing a suit today is simply because I have a wedding that I have to leave for. It's up uh, about an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes away. And so I'm just trying to save time today. So that's why I'm dressed up. But usually you're going to catch me in a a button down, uh, some jeans, khakis occasionally. So if you see me dress up, you know that it's usually a special occasion. Um, And so my wife actually thinks I'm more handsome in a tie. So I I will wear a tie for her every single week. All right. Uh, But anyway, that's another story. Um, So I'm glad to welcome you today. If you are new, here's what I want you to know. Uh, Take a few moments and locate your connect card. That's on the inside of your worship folder. That is a great communication piece for us to use with you. We'd love to know about you today. We'd love to have you just fill that out. Let us uh, know how we can pray for you, pass along any comments or questions you might have. Uh, And after you've completed that today, hold on to it. And because at the end of our time this morning, uh, I'll ask you to go out into the lobby and drop it off at the connecting point desk. And there you will receive a $5 Starbucks gift card for absolutely free. No charge at all. We just are glad that you're here. And I hope that today is a great start to your week, that the reason uh, that that you, you, when you go get that coffee, you think about your time at Compassion Christian. I also want to look into the camera and uh, say good morning to those who are watching us on Facebook Live. Uh, We're always glad to have you join in, and we hope that today is an encouragement to you as well. Um, A couple of things I want to tell you about that are coming up. I don't always give commercials for things that are upcoming, but I I do want to do these, uh, these two, mention these two things. The first one is our Connect Reception. Now, the last time we did it, a few months ago, we called it the Newcomers Reception, but we realized that it's not just for those who are new to our church. We want you to get connected. We don't want you to just kind of be uh, a person who comes on Sunday morning and you just sit and you soak and then you kind of sour because you don't really do anything with your faith. We want to give you an opportunity to serve in our ministry. We want to give you an opportunity to grow in your faith by getting connected in a group, um, a life group, a home study, or something so that you can uh, you can exercise your faith. And so our next opportunity for you to, to get to meet some of our leaders, to ask any questions you might have is coming up on the 17th of November. It's going to be from 12 o'clock to 1230. Um, and there's going to be a time of informal gathering mingling. You'll get a chance to meet new people, but you'll also have some finger foods that'll kind of, you know, lighten the awkwardness of the situation of meeting new people. But we'd love for you to sign up for this today. And the way you do that is you go back to the connecting point desk in the lobby and there's a sheet of paper there. You just sign up there, give us your best contact information, and we will follow up with you and get you registered for the newcomer, uh, for the, not newcomer, see it's in my mind, uh, the connect reception. So that's going to be coming up very soon. You you don't want to miss that. Uh, And then uh, the other thing I want to ask is uh, regarding a teaching series we're doing, how many of you are going to be spending time with extended family uh, around Thanksgiving and Christmas and you're going to be having a meal together? How many of you are going to be doing that? How many of you would say that maybe your relationships with your family and your extended family, there's a little bit of awkwardness and there's tension in those relationships? Anybody? 
You might have some tension, some unresolved conflict, some unforgiveness, right? Okay, well, my series that I'm going to be doing next weekend is, uh, that I'm going to start next weekend is really designed for you. What we're going to discover is we're going to have a new outlook on relationships around the family table, and what we're going to discover is that if we can work more on ourselves and developing some, some more Christian values in us and stop worrying about other people, I think we're going to be a lot better off. And so that's what the series is about called The Family Table, and we're going to talk about this new perspective that we can have on relationships, and that begins next weekend. Um, And so even if your relationship with your family is great, that doesn't mean you get a four-week pass. We still need you to be here, right? Encourage people and pray for them. All right. Now, uh, let me tell you today that we have been in a series called Masks, and we have been talking about experiencing life for real. We've been looking at the reasons that we wear a mask and how we can take that mask off. And today, I want to to land this plane by talking about honesty. I want to talk about honesty and why it is that we often struggle with that value in our lives because really at the core of what we do, we often want to wear a mask because we want to, we want to dissuade someone from thinking one thing about us when maybe something else is true. Or in other words, we're not always honest. And so the Bible has a lot to say about this topic of honesty. There are example upon, there are many examples of men and women in the Bible who were honest And you you see the result of their life, the fruit of their labor, the good things that came into their lives. And then you see examples of men and women who were not honest with God. In fact, there's there's one occasion in, in the book of Acts where a couple was not honest with God and they got struck dead immediately. Now, aren't you glad that God doesn't always do that anymore? Uh, Because there'd be nobody in this room, right? This would be, we'd hear crickets chirping in this room today because none of us would be able to be here. So uh, when when we talk about honesty, it's something that we kind of value. Uh, If you are married, you value honesty. If you are raising children, you value honesty. If you're working in a company and they're telling you, you know, here's what we're going to do for you, you want them to be honest about it. Uh, you, You raise your children to tell the truth and hopefully you model that value in their lives as well. You don't tell them that, and you don't even model for them. It's okay to lie when the circumstance calls for it. It's okay to lie when you're going to get ahead. You don't teach them that if you truly want to to pursue this biblical value of honesty. In fact, I I read a survey, in fact, several surveys on this, uh, this week that said that 91% of all Americans admit that they lie on a regular basis. Now, I don't know how much you can trust that survey based on all the people who do lie or even the 9% who said they don't lie because obviously uh, obviously everyone does, right? So we we all have a, a trouble. We all have trouble with the truth. And one of the things that I was thinking about these last couple of weeks because I knew I was going to be speaking on this topic is I was a lot more in tune and alert to the conversations I was having with other people. All of my conversations, all of the uh, interactions, every phone call, every every time I met with someone. And so we have dozens and dozens of interactions and all kinds of opportunities to be dishonest. And so I, I realized that as I was thinking about uh, preaching on this topic, as those sociologists tell us that we either hear or see 300 lies a day. Actually, it's 200. I just want to show you how easy it is to lie. Uh, all right, so uh, I've listed a few great American lies that you and I either say or we have heard over time. Here's, here's some of the lies. The check is in the mail. The doctor will be right with you. Your table is almost ready. Or here's one that maybe we don't think is bad. Sometimes we'll say to someone, it was good to see you, when in really it wasn't. We're like, that's the, that's the last person I really wanted to see. Or how about this one, one size fits all. Lie. That is not the truth, right? Um, or parents, you know, maybe you said this to your kids and they didn't believe you. This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. They're like, no way. But once you become a parent, you'll begin to realize, you know what? It, it actually does because we, we want you to learn your lessons. Uh, but dishonesty has many different faces in our lives, but it has one common result. It strangles the life out of us, and it actually sears our conscience, which in other words, it burns our conscience to the point where we get very comfortable with telling lies. 
We tell lies all the time. We tell them at work. We tell them in our marriage. We tell them at home. We tell them in all different ways, and we don't ever think about it. Now, I think that there are several reasons, but I want to talk today about taking off the mask of dishonesty because it's going to, it's going to, it's going to hurt in the beginning, but then the results of that are going to be much better. So here's the first thing I would say to you. Dishonesty is promoted in our culture. I mean, you see it all over the place, right? Our culture endorses, embraces, and practices untruth on a consistent basis. I mean, it's all around us. We've come to expect people to be dishonest. Like in, in the realm of advertising, we know that most of the time advertisers, they're not telling us everything. And there's always an asterisk or uh, there's fine print at the bottom on the very last screen of the commercial, you know, results not typical. Won't always happen. And, and, you know, young boys, teenage boys, we discovered this the very first time we went out at the behest of an advertisement and bought our first bottle of cologne. And then we start to realize, well, we walk out into the world and all the babes didn't come running because they're, they're not telling you the truth. Results, not typical, right? So that's what we know. We, we know that it doesn't always work that way. But, you know, sadly, we expect a degree of untruthfulness in the church. The last few decades have, have, have seen uh, a really downturn in the trustworthiness of the church as an institution because you've seen all these TV preachers and evangelists and celebrity mega pastors. They end up getting themselves in trouble, you know, men or women, and they get caught with their hand in the money jar or they're, they're getting involved in a, a fair they're doing illegal things. And so people think, you know, I don't really trust anybody. And actually, that's okay because we, we are flawed human beings. No one is perfect. And so we, are, we have to be transparent about that. And I think more transparency in the church would be a, a, a good thing and not a bad thing. But uh, that's another sermon for another time. But we also expect a degree of untruthfulness in business. Like maybe you work for a company that, that has standards and quotas and deadlines, and they don't really care how you get it done. They just expect you to get it done. And maybe they don't ever say, we want you to lie. We want you to deceive. We want you to be dishonest. But you kind of know that it's implied there. And so it's really a struggle for you as a believer in the marketplace. Like, how do you live out your faith in that way? Uh, So companies are now asking employees really to take integrity testing before they will join them. And so people will look at, you know, they'll look at all kinds of things. So not only do they look at your social media your, your history of social media before they will hire you. They'll figure out what kind of person you are. They're also going to want to, know, they're, they're going to, want to know how truthful are you in what you do. Do you tell the truth? And so we expect a degree of dishonesty even in the halls of academia. I saw a survey of uh, different, p- different majors, uh, different departments and majors at universities. In fact, it was 31 colleges and universities were, were polled, and uh, around 15,000 juniors and seniors in college were interviewed on cheating. So six out of 10 humanity majors said, yes, we cheat. Uh, seven out of 10 science majors said, yep, we've had to bend the rules sometimes to get ahead. Uh, 74% of engineering majors admitted to cheating. of business majors admitted to cheating, and they didn't even interview political science because you kind of know, right? All right, yeah, we had to to put people in that, that category, but it is very rare to find an honest politician, isn't it? So all the way from the White House to the church house, we have people who bend the truth. I mean, watch for these political debates that are going to come up. And afterwards, after these politicians have spoken on their platforms and attacked the the, the platform of uh, of their opponent, they have fact checks. Like, did they tell the truth on this? And and you see it. So we've come to expect it. It's it's almost as if we have become desensitized to it. So I want us to talk today about what it means to be honest. And now, this is not just a value for those who are, those who have young children. It's not just for you to try to instill honesty for your children. It's not just for those who are now in their 20s or 30s. It's not just for for the young. It's for everybody. Uh, You might have seen a, a few years ago, CNN had a, a story of an armored car uh, that had money in it that turned over, and the, everything, all the money came out. Around $300,000 was spilling out and fluttering all over the highway, and senior citizens were going and grabbing the money and trying to run away from the police. So it's, it's for everybody, right? It's a struggle for us in our, in, in our journey. And the reason is that is dishonesty is promoted in our culture. But I also want to acknowledge that dishonesty is present in our nature. 
It is our nature to gravitate toward things that are not true because we get ahead. And there's something about us <clears throat> that is so warped and flawed that we're drawn to untruth. Now, Leonard Keeler, Dr. Leonard Keeler, was one of the co-inventors of the lie detector test. He interviewed uh, around 25,000 people, and he came to the conclusion that people are inherently and basically dishonest. Now, we're not as dishonest when we're children, Right? My wife is a kindergarten teacher, and like if she got, gets her hair uh, fixed in a different way, they will tell her, Miss Perry, we don't like your hair. <laughs> like They have no tact, no filter, because they are truth tellers. But when we get older, we begin to realize, wait a minute, sometimes the truth isn't always convenient. Sometimes the truth isn't always nice. Sometimes the truth isn't always what people want to hear. So at the core of humanity, there's dishonesty. Uh, and so not only is it part of our nature, I think dishonesty is also part of our spiritual structure. Now, you can be a born-again follower of Jesus, and you are going to still struggle with being honest. You see, this is bigger than us, and I want you to realize that, because there's a struggle going on in the cosmos. Call it what you will, but it's light versus darkness, it's good versus evil, it's Satan versus God, it's the eternal combat that is bigger than most of us are capable of understanding, and you, my friend, you and I are the object of the spiritual battle. You and I are the object of the spiritual battle. The Bible tells us that God is the father of truth, and that our enemy, the devil, is the father of falsehood. If you look in John 8, you'll see this. Here's what it says. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He is a murderer from the beginning. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So every single day as a follower of Jesus, if that fits you in this category, you, you and I have this choice. Are we going to follow the culture that says it's okay to lie sometimes, you have to lie to get ahead, everybody does it, or do you follow your creator and say, I'm going to pursue the truth even if it hurts, even if it's not convenient, even if it's not nice. You see, God's view of dishonesty is that he hates it. In fact, there's a place in the Bible that says that some of the things that God hates, and one of those things is lying lips. It repulses God, it disgusts him, and yet we've become so comfortable with it that, that we need to, to reclaim this idea of what the truth is. God hates lies because he is the truth, and dishonesty is a perversion of his character. So why should you and I care about this? Well, we should care about it because God cares about it. And little things lead to bigger things. The slippery slope, as they call it, is, is at first it doesn't seem dangerous, but then we're in a place where we've been trapped. And so here's what I want to recommend that we do today to, get, to take off our mask and get real when it comes to honesty. The first thing is to take an honest inventory of your truthfulness. So what I want you to do is I want you to ask, where are the areas where I am being dishonest or I tend to be dishonest? And then I want you to ask, how am I being dishonest? And then why am I being dishonest? And so this is your inventory. Please don't answer out loud. And if someone is sitting beside you and you're afraid they're going to see your, you know, your, your marks there, you might want to kind of shield that, but it's okay. So let's first of all ask, where are the areas that I am being dishonest? Am I being dishonest? at uh, work, but I'm honest at home? Am I being dishonest at home, but honest at work? Where are the areas where, where I will say, you know, I'm being dishonest with myself. I don't have a problem with that. That's no big deal. I can stop that anytime. That's lying to yourself, and that's called denial. So God is big enough to forgive you of that, but denial is a problem. So where are the areas where you will tend to be a stretcher or a bender or an outright liar when it comes to the truth. So where are you being dishonest? Where in the areas of your lifestyle would you say that you're being dishonest? Is it in the, the area of your, your, uh, your online activity or in the area of how the, the people that you have relationships with that you're kind of keep, uh, keep from your spouse? Are you being dishonest with your parents right now and you're not telling them the truth about everything that you're doing? Where are the areas? And so th those are the areas. And then how? How am I being dishonest? You know, there's, there's more, there are more ways to be dishonest than, than just to tell a lie. 
Actually, there, there are different ways to stretch the truth. One of them would be through slander or gossip. Slander or gossip. So slander is coming from this, this Old Testament word, which means to expose and defeat. So when you slander someone, you are talking trash about them. You are hoping to defame their character. You're hoping to impugn their motives so that other people will think less of them. That's what slander is. And then gossip is when you are passing along information idly when it's not your story to tell and it could hurt other people. That's what gossip is. In fact, slander and gossip are like these cousins and there's so much, there's more talk about slander and gossip than really any other sin in the Bible. There's just talk about it to, to, for us to stop it. So we can lie that way. We can also lie through exaggeration. You know, I, I've seen over the years where people will get in trouble because they lie on their resume about their experience or they lie about what they've done. I remember a football coach who uh, basically put on there that he had several different degrees that he had never won or earned or achieved. And as a result, he had to step down because our culture in some ways, when it's convenient, does value honesty. But do you ever exaggerate, you know, I caught a fish this far from the shore or, you know, whatever it is that, that we always exaggerate. We want to make ourselves look better. Gossip and slander are those things. Exaggeration. Uh, another way that we can stretch the truth is being silent. You know, sometimes you can sin by omission. That's what the Bible says. He that knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it sins. Sometimes you, you know the truth and you know that if you speak up and you speak truth into a situation, that's what you should do. But instead, you, you, you remain silent. You just don't say anything. You sit on your hands. Uh, I lie to you when I keep the truth from you, even though I know it could help you. So when we're silent and don't want to say anything, that is a form of dishonesty, right? That's a form of dishonesty. Uh, and then there's outright deceit. This is when we disguise the truth that there are little white lies that everybody thinks is not going to hurt them. Uh, one example of this, I remember in college, um, we had a phone in our, in our dorm. It's kind of in the lobby, and sometimes there were people uh, who would call, and uh, one, one, of, one of my dorm mates was expecting a call, and he didn't want to take the call. So he said, you know, would you do me a favor and tell them that I am not in the dorm. I'm not in the dorm when they call. And so sure enough, the phone rang. He went outside the dorm out on the doorstep, and he closed the door. And so technically, in his mind, he wasn't physically in the dorm, but what was he doing? He was still lying, right? It's, it's dishonesty. You're trying to cover it up, and that's what we do all the time. Uh, there's another one uh, that we do through cheating. Do you ever cheat on tests or cheat on, uh, cheat on your taxes or whatever that is? That, that's lying. That's dishonesty. What about flattery? You know what flattery is? It's false praise. It's when you're trying to pat someone on the back and build them up. It's only because you have a motive that they're going to benefit you. Flattery is this false praise. In fact, the Bible calls flattery a form of hatred and cruelty to flatter someone. So uh, how else are we dishonest? We're dishonest with the use of our time. I mean, if you're paid by the hour, if you've ever kind of, you know, messed with the numbers a little bit and, and inflated the actual time on task, that's, that's a way that we are dishonest as well. Well, it's not going to really matter. You know, who, who really cares? It doesn't matter. Actually, it does because it's a, it's a reflection of your character and more importantly, the character of the one you follow, who's God. Uh, another way we do this is through compromise and justifying. Have you ever received more change back uh, at a store and... You were tempted to go back, but you're like, you know what? I could really use this extra money, and it's their fault anyway. They can't count, and they would probably not give me back my money. We justify it, and we then move on. They're never going to miss it. Or you steal supplies from your work. What does it really matter? This is a multi-million dollar corporation. They're not going to miss a, a pack of paper or toilet paper or, or uh, paper clips, even stupid stuff like that. We often think nobody's going to really notice, and yet... God notices. So when we justify things, it calms our convictions and it deafens our deceit. It's a lie to say it won't hurt anybody because it will. So if we're going to do a, a faithful and honest inventory of our truthful, truthfulness, we need to ask why. So we know where the areas that I am dishonest, how am I dishonest, and now we ask why. Why are we dishonest? Well, the only thing I can point you to is that I'm not a, I'm not a psychologist, but I've observed over the years, that we have to get at the root of why we lie. Sometimes the root is fear. In the Bible, Simon Peter lied and said he didn't know Jesus because he was afraid of being arrested. 
Sometimes we lie because of fear. Cain lied because of pride. He basically said, you know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't want to be rejected by God, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill my brother. Potiphar's wife, remember her? She tried to seduce Joseph. She lied because of anger. She got rejected, and she was angry, so she made up a story, and she lied and, and, and ruined a man's life. Joseph, the man that, whose life she, she almost ruined, his brothers lied because of jealousy, so you take this inventory and you start to realize there's always a motive for why I lie. I choose to be dishonest. I choose to do that. I choose to make that decision. So make an honest evaluation of your truthfulness. And then number two, make an honest evaluation of what you win and what you lose. Now by that I mean what do you stand to gain and what do you stand to lose when you live a life of dishonesty. Now, if you look on the negative side of it, you can often gain things by lying. If I lie and cheat on my taxes, at least for that year, I'm going to have more spendable income. Now, this is being recorded, so the IRS, I'm just using that as an example. I'm sure Big Brother is watching right now. They're probably listening to me right now. Uh, but we can lie on our taxes and get more money, uh, or we can, we can lie about a, a, an event or a circumstance and gain something, we can lie about you know, the fact that maybe I'm not ready to meet this deadline and, and buy more time. We can lie to get more influence or try to lie to enhance our reputation. And there are some gains that we will get temporarily. Okay, Temporarily we'll get those gains. But when we look at those gains, you need to determine what's going to happen when the truth comes out. The Bible is very clear that gains like that are temporary. It's much like the, uh, one of the uh, sprinters in the Olympics from years ago, uh, Ben Johnson. He won all these races. He was a gold medalist. He was proclaimed the fastest human being in the world. And yet it was found out that he was doping. He was, he was taking illegal supplements to make himself faster. Lance Armstrong overcame testicular cancer that had metastasized to his brain. He comes back and he wins all kinds of uh, Tour de France's, and it, it's found out later that he was illegally doping to make himself better. And so you have, to, you have to ask yourself, is the gain of dishonesty worth the pain of being found out? Is it really worth that? So Proverbs 13 verse 21 kind of gives you an answer. Trouble pursues the sinner, but the righteous are rewarded with good things. So if you and I are constantly living in lies, it's going to be chasing us. So make an honest evaluation of what you win and what you lose. Because if you lie, and I, if you and I lie, we're going to miss out on things like character. You know why we're going to miss out? Because honesty develops character. There's a difference between character and reputation, by the way. It's very important to understand that. Reputation is what I think of you and what you think of me just based on what you, you know, can, can get on the surface level. But character, not my definition, character is who you are when no one's looking. That you'll do the right thing even if no one is standing over you or watching you. Character is who you are when no one's looking. So honesty and integrity uh, come together to build your reputation. So honesty and integrity is when reputation and character come together and they're consistent. So character is the one thing that you and I can take to eternity because it's a fabric of who we are, but also character is what we pass on to our kids. One of the things that, that my wife and I really tried to do, and we weren't always perfect at it, but we really tried to, to not model for our kids that it's okay to lie depending on the circumstance. We've tried to instill that sometimes the truth is going to be inconvenient, and sometimes the truth is not going to be what you want to do, but it's the right thing to do in that moment. So honesty develops character. Another thing that honesty does, it, it develops spiritual maturity. It helps you grow deeper and helps you go farther faster in your faith. So if I'm dishonest, I'm not going to face the sin problems that I have that keep me from growing. But when I'm honest and deal with the sin that keeps me from growing, then I'm, I'm getting better off. In fact, that's why Ephesians, Paul said in Ephesians 4, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. You know, when we build our life on lies, it's like a house of cards that one day will be discovered. Honesty also develops security. Honesty develops security. I begin to get comfortable with the truth 
Because if I am living a life of deceit, I always have to look over my shoulder. I always have to put my head down at night and think, think okay, when am I going to be discovered? When is this going to, when am I going to be discovered for what I'm doing? I provide security in my relationships with others if they know that I am telling the truth. There is nothing that is so sacred in a relationship than trust. And they say, the analogy I've heard over the years is that trust is like a brick wall that is built up one truth at a time, carefully constructed, one brick at a time. You tell the truth, you tell the truth, you tell the truth, and you build up that wall, that trust, and then one lie, one moment can break that all down. One moment of untruthfulness will destroy what you've been building. And so it's a very important value. It will develop security in you. And so after you do this evaluation of your gains and your losses, you need to ask yourself, what is it going to cost me? What is it going to cost me to pursue honesty? It's going to cost making tough decisions. The Bible says that when you're, you're trying to, to, to get character, it says to buy it at all costs, purchase it, do whatever it takes. And so you have to ask yourself the question, number one, what does it cost? But then am I willing to change who I am? Am I willing to pay the price to live a life pleasing to God where God can look into my life and say, yes, my, my, my child, I would have done it just like that. I would have said it exactly that way. That was honest. Or I would have done a business deal just like that. That was honest. Or I would have treated my family just like that. That was honest. Am I willing to pay the price to live a life of, that's pleasing to God? And it's been said before that righteousness is its own best reward. That a, that a life that is righteous is the best reward you get because you can lay your head down and not worry about being discovered and exposed. And so, finally, we come to the last idea, and that I want us to talk about practicing honesty. Because practice means that you haven't arrived. Amen? None of us have arrived. We practice honesty. We practice it. Just do it. Practice it in every area of your life. But you don't practice it until you do the work, and you do the inventory, and you do the evaluation. But then you, you find the truth in the Word of God. That's why James said in chapter 1, something I want, to, uh, I want to talk to you about this morning. He says, Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the Word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and then when he walks away, he forgets what he looks like. So the truth is this reflection and it exposes who we are. So what I want you to understand is that I can tell you confidently that the Bible clearly says that God rewards honesty. God rewards. And now how does he do that? He does it in three ways. Number one, he does it by guarding me. When I am honest, God guards me. In Proverbs chapter 2 we read, He holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield to those whose walk is blameless. So the word means to be a bodyguard whose sole purpose is to protect you. So if you and I are honest, he will shield us. It doesn't mean your life is perfect. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. But he is your shield, and that's a blessing and a reward. Okay, number two, God will bless your honesty by directing you. By directing you. So when we're honest, it's almost like we, we see God's way revealed a little bit at the time. We see God's ways revealed to us like lights that are from, a, from our automobile projecting over a dark lightless country road, and we start to see that way come open before us. The direction becomes very clear. That is a reward. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 11, the righteousness of the blameless make their paths path straight, but the wicked are brought down by their own wickedness. So when we have our own reward, it's being honest and being truthful. And then the third way that God blesses your honesty is that he does it by sustaining you. He sustains you. Honesty will always outlast dishonesty. Always. Proverbs 12 says, Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue lasts only a moment. That is what you can take and you can assure yourself that when you tell the truth, no matter how inconvenient, no matter how much it hurts, no matter how much another person doesn't want to hear it or you yourself don't want to hear it, it's the best path that God has laid out for us. Along the lines of being honest, years ago, a couple in Chicago got married at a downtown hotel. They opened up their gifts, 
And before they went on their honeymoon, they gathered all of their cash that was given at that wedding. They put it in a suitcase and they loaded up their car. And in their excitement, they left the suitcase on top of the car and drove off. The suitcase was discovered by an unemployed man. He opened up the suitcase and there was $12,000 of cash in that suitcase. I like to have friends like that who come to my wedding, right? It fell to the street and it was found by this man who was unemployed, but guess what he did? He returned the money. He returned the money. They did a search of to whom it belonged. The media got wind of it. The city of Chicago was on fire for this guy who would actually return money even though he was unemployed. How could an unemployed man do something like that? Why didn't he just take the money and nobody would ever know? When the story broke, the guy got job offers from Sony, Hilton, and Hyundai among others. Now, that see, we see the man rewarded for his honesty, and in a kind of physical way, this is an example of the spiritual way that God is in the business of rewarding honesty. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to be cash rewarded. It doesn't mean that you're going to be uh, given the promotion. What it means is your character and your integrity are the things that you can take with you all the days of your life, and that is the best way to take off the mask. It's to just be honest about your struggles, honest about your victories, honest about your position in the eyes of God, and honest with every relationship that you get in. And that will make you a person that will draw others like a magnet. They will, draw, they will be drawn to you because you are a person of integrity. And so let's pray that that will be the case in our lives this morning. Let's pray together. Father, today we know that the hard work of being honest is is not easy. It certainly is something that is uh, easier accomplished out of isolation. Lord, we cannot isolate ourselves and and think that if we're not in community that it's, it's going to be easier. Really, it's not because we are masters at deceiving ourselves. We're masters at saying uh, what we believe will justify our own conscience. So God, I pray that today we would be a people who, is, who are honest in every relationship we have, but may it start in our relationship with you. Lord, I'm like everybody else in this room. There, years and years and years ago before I came to Jesus, I wanted to have a facade of faithfulness. My, my maternal grandmother was a believer. She was a follower, and she, her greatest prayer was that one day I would become a follower of yours as well. And I wanted to please her more than anything. And yet in my desire to please her, there were times that I would tell her that I had been reading the Bible. I would tell her that I had gone to church when I really hadn't. And Lord, I I realized that I was a broken person and that I needed your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness. And when I came and I bowed my knee and I accepted you as Lord and Savior, I, I was forgiven of all my sins. I was restored in your sight. And I began an imperfect journey, a perf- uh, an imperfect journey with a perfect Savior. I made plenty of mistakes, and I still make mistakes to this day, but the difference now is that I am covered by the grace of Jesus. It doesn't mean that I lean into it and use it as an excuse to just flippantly commit sin. It means that instead I am grateful for the grace that I have, and that grace keeps drawing me back. So, Lord, I pray that today someone would understand it's not about being morally perfect and morally as a straight arrow, that, that's not even possible. The difference is in when we commit ourselves to being truthful and saying, Lord, you know my heart, you know my anxious ways, you know the impure thoughts, and God, you are the one who can forgive that sin. So God, I pray that today someone would say yes to you for the very first time. They would drop the mask and say, Lord, I'm a sinner and I'm separated from you and the only way I can be uh, made right is by accepting your gift of grace through faith. Father, I pray that today someone would would take off that mask and say yes to you. Lord, others who may be here are are believers. They've been following you for a while now. And Lord, I pray that our conscience is not so desensitized and hardened toward deceit that we've come to accept it as just part of everyday life. Lord, help us to be truth tellers in a world that doesn't often want to hear it. Help us to be truth tellers livers in a world that needs desperately to see it. Father, I pray that that would begin a revolution in us today, a simple message that we might hear 
in a, in a Sunday school classroom as a, as a child. But it's so profound, God, in, in, its, in its wisdom and how important it is. So, Lord, use this message today to encourage us and to, to walk in your path. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand together and sing our commitment song. And uh, the song that we're going to sing is perfect for this.